This is Tuna on Toast. Hey everybody, it is Striker. Welcome to Tuna on Toast. Please hit that subscribe button if you are new to Tuna on Toast. We have a lot of great past episodes and a lot of good ones coming your way. I love Frank Iero. This episode is a little bit different because we did it on Zoom. So without any further ado, hit the subscribe button. And here he is, the one and only Frank Iero. Frank Iero, can you hear me loud and clear? Hello. It's Stryker hey. here. How the heck are you? Hey, Stryker. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. Last night, you and your guys played the Troubadour. Yeah. Yeah. How the heck a fun you... show, man. Was it? <laughs> It was really fun. Yeah, it might have been my favorite of the tour. And why yeah. is that? Because of the venue, the audience, or how you guys felt together? I think maybe a, a mixture of all three. Um, you know, it's it's still a new band. And um, I mean, I was trying to do the math last night, and we're like, collectively, I think we've only played together like 12 times. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, so every time you play together, every time you have another show under your belt, um, you know, you start to 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 get tighter uh, the songs start to take on a, a different shape and, um, yeah, it just, you know, it starts to feel more of like a, a cohesive, uh, unit, you know what I mean? And so, uh, last night just felt like a, a culmination of, of all the shows that we've been doing and really things were starting to like really lock into place and stuff like that. Uh, I saw many comments on Twitter from people that were at the show and one that, and they were all great, but one that stuck out to me was the following. They said it was the best time that they've had at a concert in years. Oh, wow. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what's the, uh, what's it like walking into the Troubadour after you've been playing the biggest of shows with the other band you're in, and now uh -huh. you're walking in, you're probably have carrying your own instrument and then you're in this little room up there and you're walking down and is, does it feel like it's more pressure, less pressure? What's it like for you, Frank? Uh, you know, it, there's no easy answer to that striker right it's like uh every every show or every band ha is their own thing you know it's a totally different animal you know one uh has very little to do with the other you know and it, it never translates so like uh i love starting new bands i love that that honeymoon period of building it and seeing what it's going to become uh and so you know, I never feel like, oh, man, I was in this big room and now I have to go to the it doesn't feel like that. It's like, oh, man, I get to, I get to do this. I get to do that. You know, and uh, I'm lucky enough that I can uh, I can play and, and meet music with my friends that inspire me and, and start new projects and people, you know, and anyone wants to come see it. Like that's that's a blessing, I feel like. So, uh, it, you know, it is a totally different animal. Uh, sometimes when you're, you're you can see people's the whites of their eyes, it's a little bit, you know, <laughs> a little bit more pressure. Um, but, uh, oh, man, I had such a, a blast. That room is so special. You know, there's yeah. such a history right. at the Troubadour. And um, I, I got to tell you, like, very early on, I feel like the first time my chem ever played there, I had an awful show. And I had this, like, stigma my, he in my head about the Troubadour. Right. And I was like, oh, man, no, I don't want to play there. Like, I had a bad show, you know. But uh, that that got broken a couple of years ago uh, when I did a solo run. And ever since I've had great shows there every time. Good, so good, uh, good, now good. I look back, uh, I, I look forward to it every time. I get right. nervous for musicians who have a new project and then they go play because I think like the concentration you must need to play these new songs has to be so crazy. You're trying to entertain and play your instrument. How does that work for you on these newer shows? It's, you know, it's a, uh, I don't know how it works to be honest. <laughs> at, the, at the at the moment, I have probably around uh, maybe around seventy five songs kicking around in my head because like there was like <laughs> there was a bank of fifty that my chem we were choosing from, you know. And I just got off that, and then uh, I actually leave tomorrow to join back up. We're gonna play in Mexico City. I'm actually doing a double header that day because it's, it's a festival, right. so the Dunes are playing. Yes, and 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 my chem. Um, it, it's it's a bit of a it's a. a uh, a mind f <laughs> if you will you know uh especially to like yeah like you were saying if it's a newer band you're still getting familiar with the songs and how to play those songs and then like and then you get a lighting guy that like really wants to show off and like make everything black and you're like no i don't know the songs well enough yet please i need a light you know what i mean um but for the most part it's just uh, i guess the excitement kind of carried you through and and for me at least uh if i find something that scares the heck out of me i, I have to do it that's where I, 
I get the most uh, enjoyment, I guess, or uh, fulfillment and, uh, and inspires me, you know, to kind of do that, that kind of stuff without a, without a, without a net. You right. Know? I love that feeling as well. I like the feeling that there's a possibility my grade on my performance can be an F in this new situation, but maybe it's going to be a B plus and I'm going to feel so damn good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Hey, Frank, just <laughs> prepare because... for the worst, but I hope for the best. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because you know people that are musicians and maybe you're friendly with them, does that necessarily mean that you're going to be cohesive in a room together making songs? Definitely not. Definitely not. And, um, you know, it's it's funny. It, it was uh, it was very serendipitous about, you know, how, say, L.S. Dune started is because, you know, I've been touring for 30 years and uh and, uh, you know, all my friends play, play instruments, basically. So, like, during the pandemic, it was like, all right, these are the guys I'm hanging out with, you know, remotely or, or even just like, you know, we live in a close proximity and we're all trying to be safe. But we all play instruments. So if we wanted to start a band, like, that's my the well I'm choosing from. Um, but you never know if that's going to actually trend, translate into, like, a working band, you know. Uh, all these guys have been in other projects before. We've all been around that block, you know, we – we we played big shows, small shows, and and different things like that. But you never know if there's going to be like an ego. Uh, just because you know you're friendly in real life doesn't mean that you can work creatively with somebody. Right. Um. But it you know it was one of those things where it just worked out in the best way possible. Uh. Nobody in the band uh ha has an ego or or a, a, would never rear its head. Um. For the most part, everybody in the band kind of agreed that like you know whatever is best for the songs is what we need to do. And, uh, and that honestly is the best working environment I can possibly ask for. So, uh, it's, it just so happens that they're really great friends. They're really great musicians and they're really funny. Like I like hanging out with them a lot. Yeah, so like, yeah. it's, uh, it, it worked out for me. Yeah. When you mentioned something like you just said, everybody, it sounds like you need to be, one needs to be somewhat selfless. Okay. I'm not going to play as much guitar in this part, but you're going to shine in your part because the song will be better that way. Are, exactly. is, so is it possible that other people in bands sometimes clash about that kind of stuff? I feel like that's the hardest lesson to learn, you know, uh, especially too, as a, as a young man, like, you know, or a young person, you know, joining a band, stuff like that, you get this, uh, uh, this mentality of the kitchen sink, you know, where it's like, well, if I wrote it, and it's cool. It has to be in the song. And it's like, mm. well, that's not necessarily true. If it, if it doesn't work, you know, to further the song and make the song the best piece of art, then it doesn't need to be there. You know, that whole, like, look at me, look at me, look at me stuff. Like, look what I can do. That doesn't always translate to a great song. And so uh, sometimes the hardest thing you can do is to take a knee. And sometimes it's most, the most effective, you know. Uh, my, my dad always used to say, like, you know, sometimes the loudest thing you can say is whisper. And, uh, and if you think about it, it's, it's true. Like, you know, like, it could be, it could have, it could hold so much more gravity. You don't always have to scream at somebody to, to get your point across. Right. Absolutely. Oh man, this is awesome. So past lives just came out a few days ago, actually. I was very, I guess a little bit shocked that you guys came with 11 brand new songs. Like we had two or three before, but I mean the collection right. of songs, it's 11. There's no throwing in the towel with this band that you're in. Was that the plan from the beginning to do a bunch of songs or did it just happen naturally? It really just, I, I, honestly, the whole thing happened so organically and so naturally. Uh, it felt a lot like you were starting your band in high school, you know, and, and, and it had that much excitement as well. Um, you know, the pandemic was a, was a big deal, of course, for everybody. But, um, you know, we saw, I think, the thing that we loved the most being taken from us. And, and when that happens, sometimes you, you have a, a whole new sense of appreciation for it, you know. Uh, when you've almost lost something, that's like, I was like, oh my gosh, like when you get it back, it, it's it's the greatest feeling in the world. So I think uh, when we were able to actually start writing and knew that we were going to, we were making a record and it was going to come out and people were going to hear it and we eventually might be able to play it in front of people again. Um, it just, you know, the creativity wouldn't stop basically. Wow. So um, we originally had, uh, I think it was maybe like eight songs and then we went into pre-production and just started writing as soon as we got in a room together. And, uh, and it was it was almost one of those things where we had to force each other to kind of stop because, like, we're like, if we if we don't stop writing, we're not gonna we're not gonna finish the recording. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah, did you but uh, it's, it's really fun to write with these guys. Sorry, um, go ahead. Did you find yourselves as a whole, or you individually, tinkering extra with these songs, or were you guys pretty good at like done with that one? Come on, let's go. <laughs> um, 
No, it was a lot of tinkering because, you know, you, we started in the pandemic, so we started remotely and we're sending files back and forth through clouds and stuff like that. And then finally, I would say uh, when when restrictions started to get lifted a bit, we were in pre-production. So we actually got in a room together for two days for those the first time. And and that was actually uh, when two songs came out of nowhere. Which you ones? Know, uh, Do you remember? Was, yeah, Permanent Rebellion yes. and Sleep Bolt. Okay. Yeah, and that was like we had maybe 30 minutes left on the clock for the day. And it was like, I got this riff. We got to try it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, we ended up uh, laying those two down. And then as soon as we were ready to go record, I fell off a ladder and I broke my wrist in 10 places. So Man. that was a, that was a hard one, you know? Uh, and it, that gave us the, uh, I guess the ability to listen to what we had for a couple of months and really think about what was going to be on that record and tinker with it a little bit more. Uh, I had a, a spanning plate from basically the the top knuckle here to my mid forearm. So I couldn't move my wrist like this. It just was stuck oh, here, you know? Man. And so I would try to like strum a guitar, like just kind of using your entire arm, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, but it, it allowed me to kind of figure out melodies and, and different parts. And then when I had my last surgery uh, at the, uh, the, I guess it was the beginning of November. And then I, I recorded in the beginning of December. I think I still had stitches in when I recorded my parts for this record. Man, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Uh, you know what, though, honestly, thank you. But uh, I, I can play, and and so it's it's something I feel like it was a it's a learning curve, you know. But uh, I feel very fortunate that I'm I'm still able to play. Right. And um, you know, my my good friend Ross uh, used to tell me, you know, things don't happen to us; they happen for us. And even if we can't see what that's for just yet, uh, I, you know, I think down the line everything happens for a reason. So it's all right. I just imagine you were like Clark Griswold in Christmas Vacation, hanging up Christmas lights. Was that what you were doing? <laughs> I was. I was actually. I was hanging up lights for my daughter's birthday. Yeah, you were? I have twin no. girls. I was. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. Uh -huh. Oh man, I felt, that was the worst part about it because like they really took it hard. Like they were really. Sick, they were really scared for me, so I felt terrible about that. Yeah. One of the songs that I've listened to on repeat from your album is "Gray Veins." And oh, I, wow. right on. I love that song. I probably listened to it like 14 times. I, it ends and I just oh, hit awesome. the button going back the other way. I don't need oh, to know what awesome. it's about or anything, but where in the world did this song come from in the process? Like, get, do you have anything yeah. for me on this one? You know, it, a lot of the songs would start with just, you know, a riff. And usually it's funny, uh, Tim uh, Payne, our bass player, yep. he's, he's amazing. Uh, he, he's amazing. He's an incredible musician, but also an incredible writer and arranger. And uh, he would, you know, he would always have like a, a new riff for us to listen to. And Tucker's the next one in line to kind of give it a backbeat. Um, when I hear those two play together, it's 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 unbelievably inspiring. So I, I'll I'll have a, a part immediately, you know. And uh, and usually if I hear like you know two bars that they've written together, I can I can finish a song. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I know exactly where this is going for the chorus. I know exactly where this is going for a bridge. And then, uh, you know, me and Travis would just lay some stuff on top. And then uh, Anthony comes in with the the final, you know, masterpiece on top. And uh, uh, yeah, that song went through quite a few different changes over over the, the course of time. Um, but I, I think what, the second I heard Anthony singing on that, I actually went back and changed all my parts. <laughs> Are you serious? Really? I did. Yeah. 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 He, he's he's one of those guys, man, that uh, I and honestly everybody in this band but like mostly anthony is he's so fearless with uh his ability to write uh he, so often i've worked with uh with vocalists that prefer a stark canvas like you know like i just want to hear just the root notes and, and let me kind of pick where my melodies are going to go and see where i can do it that and that and that's fine that works for a lot of different artists uh anthony would never shy away from like a, a, a song that was chock full of melody. He would still be able to find something in there and be able to, to croon over it. Uh, it was, it was an unbelievable thing to watch and, and to get to work with. That's yeah. awesome. And I want to give Anthony a shout out because I think I don't, to me, he's underrated as a front person, front man. Oh my God. Like people I agree. that know him say, striker, what's wrong with you? But those that don't need to see him. That's, <laughs> that's what I guess what I'm getting at there. I agree with you on that, man. He is, he's, that's one of the toughest jobs in the band. I feel like it's, for me at least, in, in my opinion, I think it's drummer and then singer. Like being wow. the singer of a band or being the front man of a band is, it's such a hard job, man. You have to, you know, entertain in between. Um, you have an instrument that you can't see that's affected by, 
every element in the world. Um, and uh, he's just got such a natural charisma about him. He can engage an entire room. Um, you know, he's just that type of person where when he walks in, everybody's on his side. You know what I mean? And that's a rare quality. It's a, it's an intangible thing, but he has it. Um. So at when we were young fest where you guys played and obviously you've been doing yes. all these huge shows. I was at one of the forum shows and it was awesome talking about my, oh, right on, yep. but overall the bands that kind of somewhat formed at a similar time in a scene quite a few years ago, have this unbelievable resurgence, which I have been saying on the radio on my podcast, it's deserved. Some of these bands weren't appreciated as much as they should have been all those years ago and now many are realizing god damn those were good songs i should have been more into it i'm gonna appreciate it more now do you have an opinion on either what i just said or you watching it from the angle you have i you know i guess i do uh you know i feel like you know i think a lot of what you just said is 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 correct you know but i feel like that that transcends to <clears throat> sorry many different artists and many different uh genres of music you know i think the pitfall that we we tend to fall into is that um, everybody wants to label things, you know. Uh, everybody really like they want to kind of uh, what is the subgenre of this and this and this? Uh, like, what kind of word can you put on it so that I don't have to listen to the band? And that happens quite often. And I think it's you know it started out as as a, a need just to to you know to categorize things. And there's so many bands, blah blah. But really, what happened is it ended up getting uh lumping a lot of bands together that maybe shouldn't have been lumped together and uh and it it, it ends up being a a lazy crutch that we have so that we don't have to listen you know and uh and i think that's you know that's just the nature of the beast you know we're at this point right now where we have uh a thousand discographies in our pocket and we listen to the same song over and over again and sometimes we don't even listen to the whole song we just kind of skip through it right. you know um it's really our attention spans um they've changed but, in your eyes then our attention spans they've changed over i believe the last so few years i think so i think there is though i think there you know the it's so silly too i i think it's it goes hand in hand with the resurgence of, of people just like you know loving the craft of things you know and that can go from like craft beers or or weird like you know like people in that wear like suspenders and beards and and like oh this you have to listen to these you know drink these beans. Like, it's like, right. you know, I, you have to listen to the 180 gram vinyl. It's like, you know, I don't know if I subscribe to all of that stuff and, and with the oils and things of that nature, but I do agree with the, uh, uh, the, the process or the, the, um, the ritual of putting on a record, you know, that was a thing that I always appreciated as a kid, uh, getting the vinyl and, and looking at the artwork, reading through, um, the thank yous and, and, and the notes involved, who, who recorded the record, who were they friends with? And that's how I found out about bands, you know? And I, I, I love the, the art form of a record, you know, like from front to back, what are the B sides? What, you know, what got them from record one to record two? And, and what are the songs that maybe other people would consider throwaway songs? You know, um, I, I like that kind of stuff that, that was always really interesting to me. So when I love a band, I love them, you know, uh to the end basically like i want to see them evolve and change and make missteps and uh and just see how they got from point a to point b uh but i know that that's not how everybody listens to music you know so uh i guess i'm going off on, on a bit of a tangent here but yeah i think the the resurgence is nice because it's i think it's giving some some time uh for for people to rediscover bands and and why they are so important and why they are so good you know Sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees, but it's easier to look back. And for many people, and I'm not going to say an age because it could be any age, they're hearing some of these bands for the very first time, just like they heard Kate Bush for the very first time in Stranger Things or it's Metallica's Master of yeah. For many people, they're like, what is this song? Who's Kate Bush? What is this? Yeah. And as a Isn't result, that, that song has gone crazy, but her entire catalog has become brand new to millions of people, which is really cool to see. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, you have, you'll have times like this where it's like, that's in like an atom bomb, right? It happens in a show and it explodes immediately. Right. Um, with a, say like a band, like my band, like Mike, and it, that feels way more organic. We're like, we're playing shows now and we're getting kids and, and they're you know, like, I heard about this from my parents or, or I got these records from my older sibling and now I'm a fan. And it feels like, like the way that I found out about punk rock, you know? And so, uh, and so when you discover it, 
in that way, it feels like and you have an ownership over it and it means more. And I really love that about uh, the way that, you know, the trajectory, I guess, of, of say like my particular band has gone. Uh, I love that you mentioned when you would look at the artwork and one of the sections you read within the album, vinyl or CD, whatever, are the thank yous. That was my oh, yeah. favorite part to read. Who are these people they are thanking? <laughs> I see you're thanking exactly. maybe your parents or whatever, but who is Slim Davy from Chicago? Like, what is that? And then I would like, <laughs> yeah. and also at for, for me at times, and I don't know if this is bad or good, the record label that the group or individual was on kind of inspired me to investigate them even more. Oh, Fat Mike signed this person. What the hell's going on with this band? Who are these Absolutely. people? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was, that was huge for me too growing up. And I feel like, um, you know, th maybe not so much these days, but back then in the thank you is there would be a lot of times they would thank the bands that they would tour with. And so you would find out about other bands and then you would go and buy those records. You know what I mean? And I feel like for me, not only did I do that, but I really got into finding out who was producing records. And that's why uh, I think growing up, I was like, why does this record make me feel the way that this record makes me feel like who's, who's behind the scenes and all that stuff. And a name that keep, kept, kept popping up was, uh, like Steve Albini, uh, Ross Robinson, yes. and then down the line, like hoping to to get you know, Steve Evitz, you know, getting to work with these guys and getting to know these guys and and learn from them as well. Like, why do your records make me feel a certain way? You know, and uh, and it's just it's it's a magical thing. It's like you know the the man behind the curtain, <laughs> you know, and uh, and if you're a lover of, of of that art form and 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 those records, like it's it's important to know why. You know, why does it sound that way and why does it make you feel a certain way? Are there bands that you opened up for many, many years ago that had a positive influence on how opening bands should be treated or what the road is like? Do you have any experience with that or anyone pop pop up for you? Yeah, you know, honestly, yeah. Um, you know, there there was a lot of bands over the years that 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 were mean to us. And there was a lot of bands over the years that were really, really kind, wow. you know, and, and took us under their wing. Uh, and then oftentimes you would have a little bit of both in, in certain bands where like, oh, wow, that guitar player and drummer really don't want to know us. But, you know, but the but the bass player and the singer are super fucking kind and, <laughs> and they really like, you know, like want to hang out. But I remember, um, you know, some like it, it depended, like bigger bands, smaller bands. Our, our first couple of tours we did, uh, we, we toured with a band called Under Oath, right? Yeah. Under and yeah. Under Oath was always so kind to us. I remember... You know, they they really showed us the ropes of, of touring and, and, and things of that nature. Like, you know, like, they're like, you know, you could call the promoter and ask for like chips and salsa and they'll give it to you. Like you can eat. And we're like, really? <laughs> they're like, yeah. And if you sell like a couple more tickets, they might get you peanut butter and jelly. And we're like, <laughs> yo, you can get peanut butter and jelly. Like, It was huge. And they would like, you know, they would give us T-shirts and stuff like that because like we didn't have, you know, we couldn't do laundry. We didn't really have clothes. Like it was it, they were really, really nice to us in the beginning. And that was a really kind I remember um, going out on tour with Green Day uh, in around like 2004, 2005 or something like that, that. And, and watching the way that that stage show went and how calculated every move was. And I was like, wow, OK, you know, that doesn't always work for us, but I could see how it could work in some ways, you know, like because their show is, you know, there's there's pyro, there's there's cues and things of that nature. And, you know, we hadn't seen anything like that before. Um, and they were, you know, and they were kind to us on the way up. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, there was like instances like that, uh, of bands just kind of showing you the ropes. You know, I remember going on tour with face to face one time and breaking down and then pulling over and saying, all right, get in our, get in our bus. And that was like the first bus we ever got in. Wow. <laughs> it was like, oh my God, we're getting in a bus. This is amazing. Oh, and we slept on their floor to get to the next show. Like, you know, like things like that. Um, those little kindnesses, they mean a lot, you know, uh, especially when it's you versus the world you know, and you versus the elements, uh, those little kindnesses go a long way. And, uh, and I remember who was really nice and lent a helping hand. And I remember when, uh, the singer of less than Jake called me a bitch when I was a kid, when I tried to give him a demo. So like, yeah, I remember it all, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, okay. The answer to this question could be one in a million that I'm on the right track. So there's a great chance. I'm not, I feel like after my chemical romance toured with green day, the time you spent in between songs sped up. At times, as a song was fading, you guys just started kicking into the next song faster. And that's what I've liked <laughs> about Green Day. 
they would just hit you over the head with the hammer. I'm not saying you guys do that a lot, but right. I felt like you picked it up in between songs. Am I a million percent wrong on that? I would say you're not a million percent wrong. <laughs> I would also venture to say that when you're a younger band and you're opening for a band, say like Green Day, you you become quite aware that no one there is there to see you. <laughs> so if you give them less of a chance to tell you that, you know, and keep hitting them with songs, you can win them over maybe a little bit quicker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's that element too. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, speak loudly with your art. And if you don't have anything to say in between songs, hurry the fuck up. <laughs> oh, love that. Love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. One more thing about Mike Kim, then I want to get back to LS Dunes. The new sure. song that you guys released, The Foundations of Decay, mm -hmm. what, was that created within the last two years or was that something you had been holding on to? No, that was brand new. Um, that was a song that you know we got together for rehearsals, and all of a sudden it was like, I think we got something new here, and um, and so we paused rehearsing uh, the songs and, and and focused on that. And I think, you know, when something like that happens in a creative entity, it it, it changes the the uh, it changes the dynamic in the band. You know, uh, all, very often when you're 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 getting ready for a tour. Uh, and and you're just you know kind of playing old stuff and and you're not really reinventing stuff. Uh, you you feel like you're turning into a copy machine. You know you're just kind of like. My a friend of mine said, you know, when you're on tour, you're you're the best at those songs and the worst musician you've ever been. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're just focused on playing that set of notes in that in that order. Um, but when you you start to get in a creative mindset, uh, it, it changes the way your brain's working, right? So. Uh, we we paused the 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 rehearsals and went right into creative mode and uh, and I think that really changed the dynamic when we started to work on the songs again and it made us want to like relearn songs that we hadn't played in forever because we were feeling creative and we started to like oh man this there's this demo of a song that we only played once like 20 years ago let's work on it and we'll finish it and like that 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 just it, it makes you feel good you know it 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 makes you feel young again. It makes you feel like, oh, I remember why we used to do this. Right. And so, uh, yeah. So it was, yeah, that was a brand new song. Love yeah. the song. Love, love, Thank love you. it. Thank you. Thank you. You think there's going to be many more released over the next year or two? I don't know about okay. anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, you know, hey, who knows? I think, uh, I think I had a really great, fantastic, amazing time writing that song and, and recording it. Uh, and I would love to do it again. But I, I don't, who knows? You know, it's one of those things where, if it comes up, it comes up. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Okay, LS Dunes, Past Lives. We're at the point of the show, and this is for the radio portion of Tune on Toast and everything. Mm -hmm. You choose the song I play from your band. Like, Oh, wow. I've, I've already played 2022. I've played Permanent Rebellion. I told you I like Grey Veins, but what's... You choose what would sound best on the radio. We're on in like 45 cities at once. You choose. <laughs> Don't mess it up, Frank. I hear you. I, you know, honestly, I feel like it's funny. I, I have a lot of favorites on this record. One of my favorites to play is It Takes Time. But I feel like if I were driving my car yes. and I turned on the radio, I would want to hear Past Lives. Okay. That's the song I would want to hear. Past Lives it is. Give me All the right. nugget as we play this song. Past Lives, where did this, how did this song come about for you guys? So this song came about um, bass and drums. And then Travis came in with this insane verse part that's a, a harmonized guitar through like 65 different pedals. And it sounded so crazy cool. And I was like, I, I've never heard anything sound like this. And I immediately knew where the chorus needed to go. So it was one of those songs where uh, like Travis wrote the verse, I wrote chorus, and then we both wrote the bridge together. And it was like this perfect combination of like, hey, I'll finish your sentence for you kind of thing. Yeah. So you get this mix of like, all right, verses are this person, choruses are this person. This is exciting. I feel the your enthusiasm and energy makes me want to go create something in addition to what I'm already doing. And um, that makes me so happy because that's the point. <laughs> that's the point of creativity and art, man, is to inspire others to create. Yeah. How many of these songs do you guys play when you're doing a set? There's 11 songs on the album or so. How many of you guys do? Yeah. Played the whole record. We played the whole played record. Played the whole night. record! God oh yeah! Damn, that's a lot of and, work. And it, you know, you, it, you think it is, but it's really not. I as soon as we finish, I'm like, man, I wish we could play this thing twice. <laughs> wow, man. you know, 
Frank yeah. Gallero on Tuna on Toast and on Out of Order, the radio show. Thank you for jumping on with me. Oh, please. It was a pleasure. Greg. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on your career. Thanks for, I mean, you've inspired so many humans over the years. I'm sure you see it from where you are, but man, I really see it. So thanks. Thanks for all the great work. Wow. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You make it easy. Seriously. Thank you so much, homie. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Now hit that subscribe button. And for more Tuna on Toast, listen wherever you get your podcasts.